Recently, through some discussions I've had online with a few folks, I've come to the realization that a lot of people may not be using their software modelers in the right fashion, and it could be dramatically affecting the results they get for the worse, much worse. And I think people really need to understand this and stop with this behavior. Well, what is it I'm talking about? Well, before I go into that, let's talk a little bit about something like the Line 6 Helix. The Line 6 Helix has a guitar input in. Uh, most users plug into that. That guitar in has a variable impedance setting. There is an auto setting that when nothing else is in the signal chain, it simply defaults to a fairly wide industry standard used one mega ohm input. Now we can alter that for tonal effect. That's not what this video is about. If we set it to the auto setting, it defaults to this one mega ohm setting unless we place a block in the chain that is going to have that input react at a different impedance. So we're going to be talking today about just the standard high impedance input on most audio interfaces such as the Focusrite Claret Plus 4 Pre that I have right here. So most folks would plug into their Line 6 Helix, not think anything else of it, and start adding their amp models and effects blocks, and they get on to playing. Now, where the problem occurs is when they transfer this over and say, I'm going to play this with Helix Native within my DAW. I like the tone. I'm just going to reamp some tracks using this, but instead of going through the hardware unit and routing out to the Helix and whatnot, I'm simply just going to slap an instance of Helix Native on much in the same way we could slap an instance of Tonex on or any other software-based modeler. Now, a lot of folks are saying, well, when I do that, Native doesn't sound the same. The same preset I was playing on my Helix does not sound the same anymore when I apply Helix Native to it. And what could the possible reason be? Well, the possible reason is very likely how much input level we are hitting that particular software modeler with. And this comes down to what our behavior is when we plug our guitar into an instrument input on an audio interface. These high impedance, usually somewhere around one mega ohm, I believe the Claret Plus 4 Pre is a one and a half mega ohm. But when we plug into these, it's been brought to my attention recently that a lot of folks are coming in here and boosting the level of that up to a point where it hits clipping and then they just back it off. So maybe it's peaking around minus six, minus five, minus four. This is not something that ever occurred to me to do because it doesn't make any sense. Why would I boost the level coming out of my guitar? I want that guitar to react like that guitar. I don't want it to react like a guitar with higher output, therefore hitting the front of whatever amp modeler or amp we're reamping later with the DI tracks we recorded with that. I want it to behave much in the same way as if I took this guitar that I'm playing, whatever guitar, it's irrelevant, it doesn't matter. Whatever guitar I'm playing, how does that react when I plug it into a real world amp? Kind of like the one I'm going to be using today to demo this, which is the Dr. Z Z Rec Jr. If I plug my guitar straight into this, it has a certain sound with that guitar. If I grab a guitar with higher output pickups, obviously it's going to react different. It's going to be more saturated, more distorted because I'm hitting the front end of the amp harder. We could also add a boost pedal before it if we so desired for a special effect, but that's not what we're talking about today. If we are doing that though, and we're doing it for a particular effect that we want, then by all means do that. Nobody's telling you not to. But I think when we're calibrating our systems to figure out what the input level of our high impedance instrument input should be on our audio interface that we're using to feed into a software modeler, we would like that set as close as possible to the real world situation of having our guitar plugged straight into our amplifier. And that's how I've always calibrated my system. So I can set it once, plug in, and not worry anymore if I grab a guitar with slightly higher output pickups or lower output pickups. My system is just going to react to that guitar in the way that I would want it to, much in the same way as it would if I was plugging straight into my guitar amplifier. Now, obviously there are situations with active pickups and whatnot that are extremely hot, and that's a different conversation. We would have to make sure that we are not clipping any of the inputs, but we're not discussing that today. We're talking about the use of passive pickups. A lot of audio interfaces will have a pad that we can engage, and then we can bring it back up to a level that is appropriate. But this idea that we need to take this input level, crank it up until it's almost clipping, and get these high, high, peak and RMS values does not make any sense to me and doesn't add any benefit for us. And I'm going to show you how it can be extremely damaging today. Now, having said this, 
If you do this and you're getting great results and everything's working, then continue. It's fine. But I do want to point out to the folks who don't get great results like this and who are getting this terrible advice from folks that there is a better way. So I have always thought, as I've mentioned, I want my guitar to react much like it would if I was plugged into a real guitar amp. This has all come to light recently with the release of the new Tonex plugin by the folks at IK Multimedia. Because we're trying to model an amplifier that we have here, we want it to sound like it sounds when I plug my guitar straight into it, not like some boosted version of that. One of the big arguments I've heard for boosting this instrument level up higher is because it's to maximize signal to noise ratio. Now, while signal to noise ratio is a real issue, it is much less of an issue nowadays, and there's good reason. Signal to noise ratio is a much bigger issue back in the days of, let's say, as one example, recording to tape, where we have an inherent noise floor on that tape, let's say, that is quite loud, and we would want to get a healthy signal above that noise floor so that the signal that we're listening to is kind of, shall we say, to simplify, drowning out that noise floor. So the signal to noise ratio is good enough so that we're maybe not even noticing the noise or it isn't relevant. The great thing about analog and recording to tape like that is, well, we can push those limits and sometimes the tape gives us a beautiful saturation that's very desired. So there's no problem with pushing limits, maybe even beyond what they quote unquote should be. All bets are off in the digital world for two reasons. We have a ceiling. We cannot surpass zero dBFS or we get into this harsh digital clipping. There is no nice up there. It's all awful. So we want to avoid getting up there. Now, the idea of getting a healthy enough signal in so that the signal to noise ratio is maximized is kind of a moot point and a little bit ridiculous if anybody's telling you you need to do this. Here's why. So one of the audio interfaces I use is the Focusrite Claret Plus 4 Pre. Now, if we come over to the specifications in detail over on their website, we can take a look at the instrument input here. We see there's a frequency response from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz of plus minus 0 0.04 dB. Frequency response from 20 to 35,000 hertz of plus minus 0.15 dB. The dynamic range is 116 dB and THD plus N, so that's total harmonic distortion plus noise, minus one dBFS minimum gain is minus 96.5 dB. Now, what does that all mean? Well, if we come over to this little article on the Apogee website, it says dynamic range measures the difference between a circuit's noise floor with no signal being converted from the potential maximum level. I have a newsflash for you. This is inaudible. These specs are so good, we don't even need to worry about them. Now, what about THD plus N? Well, total harmonic distortion measures the difference in dB between a signal level, usually a one kilohertz tone close to zero dBFS. In the case of the focus, right, it told us it was at minus one dBFS. That's fine, it's gonna work just as well. And the summed level of all distortion and noise generated by a circuit when converting that signal. The specification is expressed as a negative number. It means that the total distortion and noise is 110 dB lower than the signal, the lower the distortion and noise, the less audible it is. Wonderful, so we come back over here and we say, well, the THD plus N for the instrument input on this audio interface, the Claret plus four pre is minus 96.5 dB. So I got a newsflash for you. Signal to noise ratio is a non-issue. If we crank up our input level on our instrument input by five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10 dB, it's going to make no difference to the signal to noise ratio in an audible way, and we will notice no difference. So that debunks that argument. Signal to noise ratio is not an issue. So, well, what are the downsides to just going and cranking up this level? First things first, here's how I did my tests today. I have a radial shotgun guitar splitter here in the studio, sitting right here on my desk. I use this all the time. Now, before anybody says, aha, that's why you're getting different results, you use this splitter and that's skewing it. Not only have I looked into this device, but I've also tested it myself in a number of ways. I've tested input going into it versus input coming back out of it, and it is identical. It does not change what is going into it. So if we plug an instrument into this, it allows us to send that same signal to four different sources. For instance, a real amp, a guitar instrument input on various different audio interfaces, which is how I was using it today. I also have a reamp box here. I use the new IK Multimedia Tonex Capture Box. Now, this is to allow us to take a line output level out of our audio interface put it into the line input of our capture box. In this case, it's gonna be acting as a reamp box. 
and then have the capture box or the reamp box convert that back to a line level signal to feed back into either the front end of our guitar amp. So the guitar amp thinks it's seeing a guitar plugged into it or into the instrument input on an audio interface if we need to do such a thing. Now there is an attenuation knob on the front of Tonex Capture. I leave it at full. Why do I leave it at full? Because again, I have tested this. I have run the same test signals through out of the line output of my Claret Plus 4 Pre to the line input of Tonex Capture back out of this, both directly into an instrument input on my audio interfaces and into the splitter box. So I can tell you that this system just works. What I am putting into it is what I am getting out of it. Now, I know that that won't satisfy some folks. A lot of folks really like to argue about all of this. So what I did is I recorded myself playing my Sewer Classic T Tele style guitar straight into the Dr. Z amp. Now, so that I could avoid having to mic up anything in the room, I took the output of this straight straight into the Universal Audio aux box, load box, and I utilized one of their incredible speaker sims on that box. And I wanted to work this way just so I could keep things as consistent as possible. I recorded myself playing a riff to a click track just so everything was gonna kinda be lined up as much as possible. So the first example you're going to hear is the guitar straight into the amplifier, nothing else in between and recorded into my DAW. Then unfortunately to test the splitter, I had to actually do another performance with my guitar plugged into the splitter box and the splitter splitting that signal back out and hitting the front end of the Dr. Z amp and I recorded that. So the problem with that is my two performances aren't identical. So even with that variable, when I do this, the guitars came out sounding eerily similar and I would attribute any difference between what you're hearing with them to the performance and how hard I hit the strings, where I hit the strings, which I tried to keep fairly consistent, but that would be the difference. But just so you can hear it, I'm going to play you the first power chord that I hit in this little riff and go back and forth between the two performances of me plugged straight into the amp and then me plugged into the splitter and feeding the front of the amp. That's what this sounds like. All right, what did you guys think? Even with the difference in performance, I think we can come to the conclusion that the sound of my guitar plugged into the splitter and feeding the front of the amp is going to be the same thing as me plugging directly into the guitar. Now that's important because for this test, I want it to get a little more scientific. Now that we know the splitter box, the radial shotgun splitter, is giving me the same thing on the outputs as I'm putting into it, I can now take one performance, which gets rid of that variable, I can plug straight into the amp with that performance. I can split that off to my Line 6 Helix as the audio interface, and I can split that again off to my Focusrite Claret Plus 4 Pre, so we can actually see with different devices how these instrument inputs actually compare to just plugging straight into my amplifier. Remember the whole point of this video. I want the instrument input on my audio interface, whether that be the Line 6 Helix, whether that be the Focusrite Claret Plus, to react and behave and give me the same sound as if I was plugged straight into a guitar amplifier. That's how I want my system calibrated. So we're gonna head over to Cubase where I've created a bunch of audio files and I'm gonna to explain to you exactly what I did here. And remember, the performance is exactly the same on all of these. So this is going to give me a way to dial this in so that the instrument level of my devices are gonna match exactly what it would sound like when I plug into an amplifier. Why is this important? Well, if I wanna reamp later, if I've boosted this signal artificially, I'm no longer representing what that guitar puts out. I'm now representing a much hotter signal. That is not the job of the instrument input, that is the job of the amplifier to act as a preamp and bring this level up in a way that that amp will to give us the sound we want. So if I wanna reamp later, I wanna feel confident that I've captured that guitar at the right level so the amplifier will react in the proper manner when we reamp it. 
Another situation is that I want to know that the level that I've captured, if I apply a software modeler such as Tonex or Helix Native to it, is going to work in the same manner of having that guitar plugged straight into a guitar amplifier. So first and foremost, let's go to Cubase and take a listen to these audio examples. So here we are over in Cubase Pro, and I have eight different tracks set up here. I have the real amp splitter. So this is the sound of the real guitar amplifier, just with my guitar plugged straight into it. Let's take a listen to that. <laughs> All right, sounds fine. Whether we like that tone or not is irrelevant. It's just more about having a baseline tone. So if I want to capture this tone in Tone X, I am going to be using that as how I want the final outcome to sound like. Now, because I'm using the splitter, which we've already determined is giving me out what I put into it, I can also capture the identical performance with the splitter feeding the claret plus instrument input with that tiniest little bit of gain added. And I can also feed that same performance to the Helix. So we can see what kind of levels these are giving us. Now let's take a look and see what the Helix is giving us. Come over here to my meters, my RMS max and my peak max, and let's see the levels that are coming out of this with this performance, which is just how I would normally play the guitar. A lot of folks will point out, oh, that waveform looks very small. And it does, it's supposed to, it's an instrument level input. Let's take a look here and look down here at the RMS max and peak max. So there's an example of playing with a Tele style guitar. I'm, I'm hitting the strings fairly aggressively. So I'm, I'm getting good level in for off of that guitar. So I have a peak max of minus 12 and a half. That's my peak. So I have 12 and a half dB of headroom here up and over so far away from digital clipping. I don't have to worry about it. And I have an RMS max of minus 29.6. Let's remember that and we'll compare that now to the audio inputs on the Focusrite Claret Plus. We'll zero these out and take a look again. So we notice that we are 0.1 dB difference. So that means that I would have to probably come over and adjust the input on my Claret plus four pre instrument input in a way that I can't even go down to it. We're not gonna notice that 0.1 dB difference anyway. So these two are putting out the same thing. Now you might say, why did you use the Helix as kind of the baseline? Well, here's why. When I take either of these now and reamp them through my Tonex capture box, so that's coming out of a line output of my audio interface into the Tonex capture box with no attenuation, just simply plugging it in, setting it at its default setting, coming back out of the instrument outputs into my guitar amplifier and feeding it either of these signals. That is what the sound of this track and this track would be. This is reamped using the input we received from the Claret instrument input, and this one is the Helix. Let's start with the Helix. We're gonna go with real amp splitter here. This is the real amp. And then what we're going to do is listen to it in comparison to the Helix input and see if you can tell any difference. I would say it's so close it's not even worth talking about. Let's take a listen. Now, if we do something interesting and just narrow it down to just like, let's say one chord here instead, or a couple chord hits, this gives us even a better insight into it. It gives us a short enough sample to get rid of any of the differences as how I performed this riff throughout the riff. These chords on this part here might've been hit 
harder or softer than those same chords somewhere else. So if we compare the real amp to the Helix like that, then we may get skewed in our listening. So now we hear these are pretty much the same thing. So I know that the Helix guitar instrument input is basically giving me the same behavior with that guitar as plugging into a real amplifier with no extra level added to it. Now, how does the clarette work with this same sort of situation? Well, let's take a listen to that in the same manner. And remember that I've added maybe a I don't know, a dB and a half of gain to it just to give it a tiny little bit of level. It's barely changing it. And in fact, if I was to say if somebody wasn't sure if they should or shouldn't boost it, I would say just leave it on its minimum setting and you're probably going to have a much better representation of what your guitar sounds like going into an amp than if you boosted this up to, you know, 5 dB below clipping. So let's listen. Here it is, real amp again versus the clarette reamped version of it. So this is the sound reamped but utilizing the capture of the clarette instrument input with the tiniest bit of gain added to it. There you have it. There's really no difference here. So what does this tell me then? Well, it tells me that when I plug into my guitar amplifier, direct in, there's a certain sound. That's the sound I'm after. That's how I want everything to react to that particular guitar. Now, when I plug into the instrument input of one of my audio interfaces, I would like to have that same reaction. So I can print that guitar DI track down and feel confident that later if I have to reamp it, I am hitting that amp with the exact same signal as when I originally played that guitar part with that guitar. If I decide to reamp it utilizing a software modeler such as Helix Native or Tonex, I have absolutely no problem with that because I also know that the input into that modeler is going to behave in the same way as if I had plugged straight into my guitar amp. Now, I'm going to prove this even further in a moment simply by utilizing a capture in Tonex. But before we do that, let's go to a different situation now. Let's say we go and we boost that Claret Plus input level up much higher because, you know, again, this apparently helps with signal to noise ratio. Well, here's what we get from that. And let me just come back out to this. So what you're gonna see here, like we said, is if I unmute the claret plus with the tiniest bit of level added to it, we have these levels over here. And I think we said we maxed out somewhere around minus 12.4. Now, if we go push that input level up here into the range where both Tonex software asks us to raise it to and where most people are raising it to, we get this. And I've heard this as what a lot of people use as a baseline. Like, let's, we'll get it so it's peaking around minus five or minus six. So now we have this at what? Seven and a half dB-ish louder? So we're gonna be hitting the front of our guitar amp now or our guitar modeler with seven and a half dB more gain. Well, what happens when I take that and then I use that to reamp through the amp? So here's the real amp and here is the sound of this reamped with this new raised gain level. All right, so that's it there. Now let's listen to the real amp and I'll go back and forth. Remember, the real amp is the target of how my guitar sounds like plugged straight into that amplifier. Coming back to our test here, where we compare one little chord. Anybody can hear that. We have much more saturation and distortion. The tone kind of falls apart. I don't like it at all. Why would we do this? This makes no sense. We basically leaving our level alone on most modern interfaces. Obviously, if your interface has a super low level on the input, then we do have to bring it up, but we wanna only bring it up to the point where it's matching the sound of our guitar 
plugged into an amplifier that we would be possibly reamping through. So I hope that that clears things up. All right, so now that I know plugging directly into my Helix is pretty much identical to plugging directly into my amplifier, and with my audio interface, the Claret Plus 4 Pre from Focusrite, I almost can just leave it alone with no extra gain, or if I really want to be eerily accurate, I can bump it up by a dB or a dB and a half. Uh, if I didn't bump it up that dB, dB and a half, unless we were doing a real critical analysis comparing the two sources, I don't think we would even notice. Whereas when we crank that gain up to what some people say we need to, then we destroy the tone and we're now no longer representing what that guitar actually sounds like plugged into an actual guitar amp. What's another reason why I would want to avoid cranking that input level up? All guitars have a different output level. I have a number of Vigi Excalibur guitars. One of them has pickups in it that are much higher output. I like that when I need that. I'm not going to grab that guitar when I want the sound of a Strat or a Tele or maybe a humbucker pickup with a lower output. It's just not the guitar for that situation. So with the Dr. Z amp I'm playing through today, I may not grab that guitar ever. But if I'm plugged into a Marshall and I want to really hit the front of that Marshall heart, that might be the perfect guitar. I have different guitars, so I can utilize different guitars for different tones. That's why we have them. Why would we want to take a guitar that has lower output pickups, use the instrument input as a preamp to boost that up, much in the same way we would do if we were just putting a clean boost in front of every amp. We don't do that all the time unless it's the effect we want. So here's the problem now. If you take the instrument level that had me peaking around minus five, and I grab my higher output Vigia Excalibur, here's what happens. Keep an eye right here on mono input two. You'll notice I have this beautiful red Vigia Excalibur uh, that has much higher output pickups. So Claret Plus right here is the Number one input set the way I had it up here, which is behaving in the same manner as if I was plugged straight into my guitar amp. And here is the second instrument level with the gain raised up to the point that I showed you here. There was no clipping involved with the other guitar, but there's also a lot less headroom. So now watch what happens as I hit this. So watch my peak meters right here. This is the boosted level that we heard up here with the new guitar, and this is the way I would normally run it. All right, over here, I now still tons of headroom. It's still going to react as if this guitar was plugged into the amplifier. This one over here was clipping and peaking. So now I'd have to come over and I'd have to recalibrate my whole system. I'd have to turn this back down. If I want to play my telly, I want the amp to react to the telly. If I want to play this guitar, I want the amp to react to this guitar. If I don't like the sound of this guitar plugged into that amplifier, then I won't use this guitar. I will go to another guitar. So I hope that clears up one of the big problems with this idea of just always pushing this up to like the minus six, minus five point. Well, we're leaving ourselves very little headroom. We're not maximizing signal to noise ratio or dynamic range or any of these other terms that people throw out there wanting to sound like they know what they're talking about. We're simply just giving ourselves less headroom. And now we're going to, with certain guitars, have to turn them down. Now, when we compare that to the lower output guitar, we're not really getting the accurate reaction from the modeler of the amp that that guitar is putting out. So what about, let's say, Helix Native, for instance? Well, let's go to the Helix Native manual. What I really like about the Helix Native manual is this. It has a section called Optimizing Input Level. The level of the input signal entering Helix Native plugin can affect the overall gain and saturation of your tones. That's exactly what I've been trying to tell people. Therefore, it is essential to gain stage accordingly. It's important to note that most Helix Native amp and effects models are designed to receive instrument level input signals, much like plugging an electric guitar directly into the same type of amp or effects pedal we modeled them after. To follow are several tips for achieving the optimal signal level. For the most accurate results when recording dry electric guitar or bass, we recommend you use an audio interface with a high impedance or instrument input. Fine, that's what we're doing. For monitoring your input signal level or the playback level of any clips within your track, reference the master input level meter. So we want it in this range here. Look at the range. Minus 36 dB to minus 12 dB. That's exactly, exactly the range that my Helix input and my slightly raised input on my Focusrite Claret Plus 4 Pre is in. 
it's perfectly within that range. Not up here in the boosted volume of minus six or minus five. That 6 dB difference in that peak level is going to bring the RMS level up, which is going to hit the front of the amp harder and not give us an accurate representation of what that guitar sounds like plugged into a normal amplifier. All right, so what about using Tonex now and modeling this? So we come over to our modeler and we hit guitar and I hit next and I say, yes, I'm going to model an amp and a cab. Now, I am going to use instrument level two here because I can change that. My number one is calibrated perfectly. My input seven here is the return from the Universal Audio Oxbox because that's going to act as my cab. So this is all set up exactly how we want. We're not utilizing microphone two, so we go over here. Now, levels check, step one input level. This is irrelevant. This does not matter. I can't stress that enough. This has nothing to do with the modeling process. This is simply going to be for after when we're auditioning our tone model. So no, we don't need to touch this. This needs to be set wherever we normally set it. Now watch what happens. I plug into my telly with my Focusrite Claret Plus 4 Pre Instrument 2 level set with no extra gain added. This is the guitar I used for all those exam audio examples earlier on. No matter how hard I hit it, even harder than I would ever dream of playing, I cannot get this into the appropriate level. So if I do raise this up, now I'm closer, but man, have I ever boosted that? This is not how I run my instrument input, so it's not gonna give me accurate results when I go back to my calibrated system. Now, if I switch this over to my calibrated system on input one, I'm quote unquote way too low for this. Again, it doesn't matter. I don't care. This has nothing to do with the modeling process. I hit next. Now this is telling us to basically fix the problem that we just caused previous. And it says, well, use your analog attenuation so that now that you've boosted your guitar level, now we want to cut it so it sounds exactly the same as the sound of our rig. Now that sounds all wonderful and great, but the problem is if that input level that we set is not my new input level all the time, then this analog attenuation now has given me a model that's not going to be accurate for how that guitar really sounds. I've already shown you why I have my levels set at those lower levels. That's how my guitar reacts in the real world with an amplifier. So this step here, I skip. I leave that analog attenuation on full because when I run my proper input level over here, everything is just going to work. The signals that IK Multimedia uses to do the models are irrelevant. They work, they do the job. It doesn't matter that they're louder. It's okay. And quite honestly, I've never had any clipping and I've done hundreds of tone models using them. While they do hit the amp louder, they still work and give me an accurate representation. I come back over here and it tells me to set my input level, which I would do on, in this case, on my Universal Audio Oxbox. I've got that ready to go. And then I hit next and I have everything set, I do a capture. So how did those captures turn out? Well, if I come over to the Claret Plus and Helix versions of their instrument inputs, and I now put an instance of Tonex on here, and I did the capture and I called it instrument input test. Okay, I just left it as it is. I haven't added anything to it, and I'm gonna do the same thing here. Now, the only thing that I do have to do is I had to raise both of these up 4 dB so that the tone model playing back this file is the same level that we're listening to as the track I record with my real amplifier. And we have to do that, otherwise things won't sound accurate. So let's listen to what that sounds like. Here's the real amp. Here's the version using the Claret instrument input into this new tone model, which is the identical sound we were hearing here with the real amp. I would say pretty impressive. Let's try the Helix version. Yeah. 
I don't think anybody's going to be too upset with those results. They sound incredibly close. Let's now go with just this couple power chord hit and go back and forth between these. So how were the results? Well, they were perfect. They were as close to perfect as I would like them to be, and I'm not going to complain about that. I'm moving on. So I've calibrated my system so that it sounds identical to the sound of me plugging into the guitar amp. Now, is that just for this guitar amp? No. I've modeled many, many amps. This is the same situation. I've set this up once. I go through my tone modeling process. I don't change my audio inputs. That's where they are set optimally. I don't attenuate on my capture box for that model. I just grab it. Everything works. Do we maybe have to match the volumes of the tone model later? Sure, that's fine. That's an output level volume, not an input level volume. Now, when we transfer those tone models to Tonex pedal, we need to have the input trim set somewhere between minus 10, minus 11, minus 12. There may be something new coming about that in the near future after I've spoken with the folks at IK Multimedia. We shall see what happens. But that for now, if we want the same tones as what you're hearing from the tone model, that's what needs to happen if you're setting your instrument input to the proper level. So I hope that that's helpful. I know there's gonna be a lot of folks that are gonna come and argue about this, but trust me, I have done this many times with tone modeling, with reamping. It's what I do. I create these tones and I need them to transfer to other people's systems. If you take a tone I created, turn the input way up on your instrument level input, you are not hearing that tone how it is supposed to sound. You would be far better off leaving your instrument level quite low. Think of what line six said as far as Helix Native. We want it within that range. Peaks at minus 12. Lots of headroom for different guitars. And we want that level to be between the minus 36 and the minus 12. And if you do that, I can guarantee your tones are going to improve. Everything's going to work better for you. And I think everything is going to translate much better. I really hope that that was helpful. And I hope that that puts to rest this myth of we need to maximize signal to noise ratio. We need to boost the level of our instrument input. That is not supposed to act as a preamp. It's supposed to give an accurate representation of how that particular guitar we have plugged in sounds. And I'm hoping that the tips I showed you today help you on your journey and help you to get better tone. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I really feel this is one of the most important videos I've ever made. Please share it far and wide. Please share it with folks that you think would get use out of watching it. Also, please like the video and please subscribe to my channel. Hit the little bell notification to get notified when I put new content out. I'll be back really soon with some more. And I want to leave you with a couple of my presets. One for the Line 6 Helix. This is my Interstate Z Ultimate, which is a model of the Dr. Z Route 66. This is available for Helix at the Line 6 Marketplace at the link below. And I also want to let you hear my my new Tonex tone model captures for the Dr. Z Z Rec Jr., some of my favorite tones ever. Here's the demos for those. I hope you enjoy. The links are below if you want to grab these tones. Thank you guys again. Ciao for now. Uh -huh.